Good morning to all of those joining us for the live stream this morning, this first Sunday of March, March 3rd, 2024. Did you miss me? Well, I was talking, I was talking to those ones online, but yeah, okay. Been away for a couple of weeks on vacation and uh, let's get, let's get after it. Message this morning, the scripture reading comes from Luke's gospel, chapter five, verses, I'm reading verses 17 to 26. One day, Jesus, oh, let me stop. We are gathering uh, after the message this morning at the Lord's table. So for those of you joining us online this morning, if you wish to have a little something to eat and some drink, you can partake in that service with us. It's, it's an invitation from Jesus Christ. And so if you believe that Jesus Christ is the living, risen son of God who died for your sins, then that's your invitation, invitation from Jesus to, to partake in that portion of the service after the message. So the reading, Luke chapter 5, I'm starting at verse 17. One day, Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. They could not find a way to do this because of the crowd. So they went up on the roof and they lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins were forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home, praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray, Lord, that you write your word and your message upon our hearts. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I can't really recall how many years ago it's been, but when my dad was alive later in life, he was asked uh, by a church or two every now and again to speak and, and to preach. Now, Dad's rough or not so subtle attitude came out in his preaching. And I did take in a few of the messages many years ago. He would speak of faith and hope and especially the power and authority of Jesus Christ. Dad was what I would call, he was an old-time conservative Christian. And we didn't always agree on some things. He held fast to the Old Testament scriptures, which, you know, he had some points. And I'm learning. I'm still learning. He didn't really like my new international version Bible. And at times he questioned it. Maybe even thinking that it may not even be called a Bible. And even though he had his own weaknesses and faults, like we all do, he was conservative. But boy, he could preach. And he could teach. And he could live a life of faith. It'll be 21 years this June since he passed away. And as I began to to preach myself here in Smith's Cove in 2006, I began trying to recall, Dad didn't have a manuscript. He had a few handwritten notes and his handwriting was pretty good, but it was kind of hieroglyphics. But I was, as I started preaching here, I was trying to recall a message he spoke about one time about Jesus healing this paralyzed man in Luke chapter five. And after some years, I finally remembered the points. I, there was a couple points I could remember, but the third one, just I couldn't remember what it was. Well, I finally remembered it many years ago. I formed a message and I delivered it here in the Cove in 2011. Now, if any of you remember it, that was back here, here back then, I'm uh, kudos to you. I'm going to give a revised version of that message today. And as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the live stream, I was been on vacation. Nikki and I got away for a couple weeks and and uh, where we were staying, I seen this, he was obviously a Canadian, boy was built, 
and uh, a military guy. I suspect he may be in his 40s. And he had a tattoo. His whole arm was tattooed. And the first time I seen it, I was kind of behind him. And it had courage and great big bold letters going down his arm. And I, I wanted to immediately maybe think of this message. The three C's is what they had called it. The three C's of Luke 5. The first C is compassion. And for us as Christians, we need to have compassion for others of the faith and, of course, for those who are lost and, and in need. If we have no compassion for the troubles and the needs of others, then us as Christians, we need some work. We need work on our Christian lives and our faith. Jesus' entire life was about God and Jesus having compassion for us, their creation, and the task at hand. For Jesus was to bring salvation through his sacrifice. That's Jesus' life and his compassion for us. And we're to emulate Jesus' life. So as we dig deeper, let's look into this, the human aspect of what we read in Luke's gospel in chapter 5. The aspect of compassion and the friends of this paralyzed man. They had heard about Jesus, of course. They had compassion on their friend. They were thinking, we need to get our friend to Jesus, not to outpatients, to Jesus. They were doing what they could do to help him. But he couldn't get to Jesus on his own, so they took him. In Luke 5, verse 18, the men carrying the paralyzed man on the mat, they tried to take him into the house to get him in front of Jesus. They were having compassion for someone or something well, think about our lives. We might recognize a need, having compassion for someone or something and doing nothing about it, really, that's just a wasted thought in my mind. It can't be called compassion. A thought of doing something good and the deed left unaccomplished, how does that help anyone? In James, chapter and verse, can't tell you right off the top of my head. James says, you say you have faith, I'll show you my faith by what I, what I do. Faith being, being put into action. There's also a saying that we have, it's not scripture. The world is full of good intentions. Hmm. A good intention, a good thought. These need to be put into action. After compassion, the second C is cooperation. Sometimes we have compassion and actually have the will but maybe we don't have the resources to do what needs to be done. And sometimes, well, we can't do everything on our own. And maybe it's time that we sought some help from others to accomplish what's at hand. Luke 5, 19 shows us where the friends of this paralyzed man, they had to get together to get him to Jesus. One person on their own couldn't carry that man there. Maybe that military fellow could because he was big. But this, this paralyzed man needed help. They couldn't find a way to do this. Not on their own. The crowd was in the way. And so they cooperated to get that man on that mat on the roof. And they let him down through the tiles of the roof. Right in front of Jesus. So we can see where they were cooperating all the time. But maybe we don't always recognize it. You know, the cooperation that we have going on in our community our church, even in our, our fellowship here in the Cove or even beyond. We have cooperation looking after the church building. We, we cooperate as believers here in the leadership. The church cooperates to help in the church's functions. The ladies auxiliary cooperate with one another and with the rest of the congregation. And, and we pull together fundraisers and different things to meet certain needs and goals really as a church, to do the fundraising or that cooperation that's no different than many of the other organizations that we see. Things that need to happen to accomplish certain goals. But what about the specific needs of specific individuals? Like this paralyzed man in Luke's gospel. Is there someone that we know who needs our help, but on our own we can't do it? I suspect there is each and every one of us. If you can't do it on your own, that compassionate thought needs to be put into action. So you need to find the people 
to help cooperate with you, to find a person to help in that particular need. And maybe the help, maybe the help you need is closer than you think. Maybe it's gonna be someone outside the four walls of this church that can help or needs the help. Recently, I, I knew, well, I know a person who was very ill. His life alone at home was taking a turn for the worst and I was made aware of it. I visited, I seen the need. It wasn't something that I could tackle on my own, especially when I was gonna be leaving on vacation shortly. God put the right people into my life to form a team to help that person. Things are improving for him. Maybe there's a less serious need or maybe a, a more serious one that you know of. Compassionate thoughts are not gonna cut it. Or maybe, you know, there's groups of people that are afflicted in some way. Maybe it's a program or a group that can be created to help people with different kinds of issues dealing with death or addictions or single parents or all the other many struggles that many in our lives and in our communities are facing. There's tons of situation where our, our situations where our compassion, if we'll put it into action, find the cooperation of others, we can change lives. In an area of your life that you have compassion for, or something or someone who is in need. You need that cooperation of others to pull it off. Talk to me, you talk to others of, of that vision of what can be done. See if there's something that can be addressed. The third C, the final C, well, is courage. Just like that tattoo. I, I said to that man that I met, I says, you're in the military. And he says, no, I'm retired. I said, well, I'm not in the army. Not in the one that you were. I said, I'm in the Lord's army. I'm a pastor. And I'd like to take a picture of your tattoo. Because courage has inspired a sermon. He didn't say a word about all that. Yep, take your picture. And off we went. It takes courage to help people sometimes. And maybe it's a, a, a situation where you or I are not an expert. Who of us are experts in everything? And maybe when you or I are convicted and, and compassion and cooperation is present, but then comes we need courage to get moving, to be in prayer and to expect God to move. It takes courage. Finding others to help or God finding others to help for you or me. And together we can be strong enough to begin to act on the issue at hand. I don't know about you, but I know that if, if we had been, you know, if we could be transported back some 2,000 years ago to this scene in Luke chapter 5, and a few of us guys, or whoever's not afraid of heights, pulled a paralyzed man up on the roof of somebody else's house, and we started tearing the roof off the house. Do you think the owner's going to be happy about that? There would be ramifications. It's going to take courage to face those ramifications those ramifications of our actions maybe sometimes our actions to help someone maybe they're not going to be well received by others so when we act with compassion and cooperation we need courage again in verse 19 when they couldn't find a way to do this to get him in front of jesus they went on the roof and lowered him down through the tiles these friends put their own lives at risk. They probably didn't have aluminum ladders like we had today. They didn't have them cherry picker things to kind of scissor them up there, you know. Didn't have any of that. They were probably going to be facing financial losses or at least time and, and labor to fix that person's roof because they just tore it apart. They did that to help their friend. And in verses 20 to 25, Luke tells us what happens to that paralyzed man and how he received help from who? Jesus. His friends used compassion and cooperation and courage to get him into in front of Jesus. The goal had been accomplished. The compassion, cooperation, and courage of the paralyzed friends, man, they seen to it that their friend was healed. 
And the results, of course, the friends grew in faith because they were doing God's will. The crowd that witnessed the, the event, they were blessed because they were amazed because they had seen a miracle. Everyone was amazed, it says in verse 26, and gave praise to who? God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Don't you think the people that we help and that can, we can have a positive Christian influence on, don't you think people who can receive help through us? God's church. Don't you think that some of them may be drawn closer to God? by our actions, by our compassion, our cooperation and courage. There's lots of people that want to be part of something good like that, helping someone, whether they're saved or lost in the name of Jesus Christ, something done, maybe sometimes it's done in secret or it's done where it's not advertised everywhere. So that's great. It's not always possible. But we can end up giving people hope without having them listed on a billboard somewhere. God has laid upon our hearts for certain things to be done. And if we can help in secret or help, you know, under the radar, it's great. Oftentimes when people receive help, they're compelled to give back. And I've seen in the past, whatever like that, where people are helped through the church that well, it gives them a different perspective on the church because let's face it, the church doesn't, you know, church in general doesn't have a positive, you know, it's not positive for a lot of people. But for us, this congregation, when people know of the help that, you know, we're given to whoever, to whoever it may be, people may end up being in the church because of it. Maybe not this one. That's not the point. But if people do show up and their lives are changed and they start looking to God in a more serious and developed way, don't you think when we see people's lives turn around that us too, we are amazed that God would maybe even use us? The miracle sees of Luke 5. I'm certain that the message is, is nothing like what Dad would have preached some 23, 4 or 5 years ago. But the, those three C's, they remain the same. The message has the same principles. It's just delivered by a different crest. And a whole whack of years later. I wasn't really attending church on a regular basis when I heard that message from Luke chapter 5. When dad first let it loose. Wish I had paid more attention. Wouldn't it take me years to figure out what that third C was. It's a short message. It's one that we can understand. It's one that we can relate to. It's one that can help change the life of someone else. And not only that, it can change our lives too. It can change the dynamic of this church if we're willing. If we're willing to put these three C's into motion. And not to, to repeat, but think of some of the needs of individuals and families that are in our lives, that are in our our circle of influence. Sadly, there's an overwhelming amount of need. Maybe there's abuse of some sort, physical or psychological. Men or women are having a rough time at home. There's tons of single parents. Maybe some of these issues that people have stem from way back in their past and they still really haven't dealt with it or they think that they're all alone. Maybe you've had similar experiences. Who else can share in situations like that? Maybe it's you to break the ice with someone else. The three C's, maybe they don't always work in that particular order. Compassion, cooperation, and courage. But they're there. As we're unloading to God ourselves for help, and God has given us each other to unload to, to share. This is part of the church. This is part of one of its functions, that we, we shoulder one another's burdens. Helping others can happen when we're willing to help ourselves. And incompetent, sharing with one another, breaking the ice with someone. 
maybe there are others that have some of the same issues that we have that either one, we can receive help or offer help, create bonds, share, and in the process, heal and give praise to God. There's tons of need. There's more coming. And it may often always seem overwhelming if you're thinking of tackling something on your own. So remember those three C's because we're not alone. It's going to take certain aspects, more or less, of one of those three C's. And the three will be more, some of the C's will be more challenging than others in individual cases. We can help one another with all kinds of issues. And we can pass this help off to those in needy situations. In verse 26, again, everyone was amazed and praised, gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. As believers in Jesus Christ, we were not made to be alone. And as people of the same faith were made, the church has been made for us to gather, to be in worship together, to fellowship and praise God together and to serve him. As a group, we can lean upon one another in times of trouble. And this is why that people who profess to believe they need to be in fellowship with one another in church, in its life and in its ministry, to serve us to God and community. And as a reminder from Jesus himself, as he's told us to, to gather together in his name, to remember what he's done, it strengthens our faith. It may ignite the courage in us that we need. But we're reminded to be together, especially at his table, where we celebrate the Lord's body and his blood, the bread and the cup. These are symbols of Jesus' blood and body. May we focus on Jesus and his giving life to us. And may we recall now and forever his saving our souls, costing him the greatest price. And why? Because of love, compassion. There at the top, did it take courage for Jesus to do what he did? Remember, they were his disciples and others were telling him to stay away from Jerusalem. You go there, you're going to be killed. Jesus went anyway. You can be sure he was full of courage. And Jesus, through the cooperation of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, this is the, the Holy Three, the Holy Trinity, made complete, they have the path for us to find life, to live life, and to have it more abundant. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, too often we, we look at life and the difficulties of life. We look at them in our own strength. And we tend not to remember the strength of others that can help, let alone the strength that we can receive from you, the power from you. All things are possible when you're involved. So Lord, remind us to set our minds on your works, the works that you have done in the past, remind us to praise you for these things, to give you credit, to give you praise and glory. Lord, by having our minds set free from our own human limitations and by expecting in faith that you, Lord God, can move mountains before us, we will see and feel the power, your power, like never before. And we expect, Lord, changes in us it will change the lives of others as well. So Lord, again, we ask that you set our minds free of our own limitations. Remind us of the compassionate thoughts that you give us, Lord, to put them in action through cooperation of others, cooperation through you and your Holy Spirit, that we may have the courage to move forward. Forgive us, Lord, for limiting you, the one true, holy, living, risen God. Amen. Could I ask the servers to come forward as we uh, prepare to begin the, the communion service?
few verses of scripture as Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples before his death. Matthew chapter 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus took bread. In his wisdom, he, he used something that we would see often, food. And we can relate that we need food for our physical bodies. Jesus tells us we need him, his body, for our spiritual health, for our spiritual life. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And Jesus took bread, breaking it, sharing it with his disciples. He wanted all of his disciples. That's not just the 12 that were there. Even Judas was there for this. The 12 were with him. And all of those who will come before and place their faith in Jesus Christ, we are disciples. We are no less disciples than they were. It's the same blood and body that was sacrificed for them is sacrificed for us. It's the same blood and body sacrificed for the addict on the windowsill of the store. The drunk that can't make it home. All of these different things in our lives that we see that are not good. It's the same body and blood sacrifice for all of these things that we may find life. And breaking that bread, sharing it, he wanted all of us as believers to remember and to consume this daily, the bread of life. Dorothy, would you give thanks for the, for the bread in the body of Christ? Amen. A cup. There's a saying, you know, we all have our cup to bear. Jesus' cup was full of wine of the day. They drank wine because the water wasn't fit to drink. And the cup, Jesus says, this represents the blood, a blood of a new covenant. The old covenant was based on obeying the law. This new covenant was going to be based on Jesus' blood, his sacrifice. It was going to be based on grace from God. Grace that we all, every single one of us, so desperately need all the time. The blood of Jesus Christ was no ordinary human's blood. This is the blood of God in the flesh being poured out willingly to wash away our sins, to make the impure pure, that we can come before the God of all of creation and know that we are forgiven of all the filth and all the foul that is in our lives. Debbie, would you give thanks for the cup and the blood of Jesus Christ? Would the servers please serve?
The body of Jesus Christ, eat of it and live. The blood of Jesus Christ washes away our sins. It sees us being before God spotless and white. Praise the Lord. Drink of it and give thanks. passages that I shared from Matthew when they had finished their meal and they went out to Mount Olives and sung a hymn. Let's join in that first verse of Blessed Be the Ties That Bind. Blessed be the ties that bind our hearts in love Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for this fellowship that we have with you through your Holy Spirit. We pray a blessing, Lord, on each one, and we pray for those who are facing difficulties, Lord, whether it's the mourning of, of the loved ones who have passed, for those who are ill in the hospital or in long-term care, we pray for physical healing and, and spiritual healing, the lifting of spirits. Be with us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessings to each and every one who are present and our families near and far, and for those joining us online. God bless on the week ahead, and keep washing those hands. <laughs>